Good morning. It's good to be with you. Now this morning, the title of the lesson is Have No Fear. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 22. I started to think about this idea of fear and have no fear is uh, it's used in in speech to say that there is no reason, no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to worry. Have no fear. There is no reason. But, you know, we tend to find reasons, don't we? Or Reasons that we may think are really good to, to substitute or to, to put in there. The disciples understood this. So fear not is the most repeated command of God in the Bible. Did you know that? I mean, it would take you some time to figure that out, but... But you can. Fear not. In the King James, fear not or be not afraid is said 103 times. Fear is spoken of over 500 times in the King James Version. So what do we have a problem with? Maybe. Maybe we have a problem with fear. I'd like for us to, to read First uh, Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. This is, uh, and it goes through the end of the chapter. It's not very long, just a few verses here. But I'd like for us to get an idea of what Peter is, is shining a light on. These people, our brothers and sisters, at the time of his writing, they were... They were going through some difficult times. There was some suffering. They were scattered. <clears throat> and when that's the case, when you're in a, a dark world and you're the light that's shining because of Jesus in you, you need, you need to be able to focus on things, right? I mean, you need a, a correct focus. A lot of things vie for our attention, right? A lot of things do. So we have to be careful where we place our eyes, where we place our attention, because it really matters. And we've seen what Peter says in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, about for the Lord's sake, submit, be this way. It's for the Lord's sake. It's, it's because you're in this dark world and, and you're strangers in this world. You're aliens. You're, you, uh, this world isn't your home, but as you go through life, People need something to see. And that's Jesus. And so he encourages our brethren for the Lord's sake to behave in this way or in that way. And so verse eight, finally, all of you, I guess that would include everyone. Wouldn't you think? Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. The Lord's eyes are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you 
for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So that's what I want us to focus on this morning. All of us, every Christian, our focus in this dark, evil, unforgiving world, our focus is Jesus. That's what Peter is is trying to get across to us. Jesus is the epitome of the things that we should possess Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind, not repaying evil for evil. No verbal abuse returned for verbal abuse. That's reviling, right? So we could find examples in Scripture where Jesus is our example in all of these things. And so we follow him. In verse 10, Peter reminds us, of what Psalm 34 verses 12 through 16 says. And so he goes back to the Old Testament. He does that a couple times. He'll he'll take us back to Isaiah in a moment. But we are to be people that are filled with peace, right? And we get that from Christ. So we're to be peace filled people, but but maybe we don't always respond to those that are not in Christ in in the way that we should. We sometimes maybe make mistakes. You might be in that boat sometimes. It's acceptable in this culture. It was acceptable in that culture, I'm sure, in the world to get back at people who've hurt us, right? Someone that isn't being uh, guided by Christ. They've not placed themselves under the authority of Christ. They may say, well, yeah, if somebody, somebody does this to you, then you do that back to them and, and then some. You know, get the point across. Lots of television shows, movies are made about revenge, Right? I mean, some of the titles are incredible. I don't even want to say what I've seen with my own eyes. The ti- just the titles of these, of these movies that are offered for us to, to feast our eyes on and, and be emotional about. So it's acceptable in culture to be that way or to think that way, at least at least to tear them down verbally, maybe give them a good tongue lashing. That's probably what they need, right? You may work with people that just need a good tongue lashing, right? That's what, you know, maybe you think that, but then you think a second thought and that thought gets filtered through Jesus and he says, whoa, 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 pull back on the reins on this one a little bit here. Let's think about this. So we go back to Matthew chapter five and we read the Sermon on the Mount. And as you read the Sermon on the Mount, we get you get to see 
what Jesus says regarding our mindset and the treatment of others, how we should treat other people. We're not going to go back and read that, but I would encourage you to do that because it's a very good uh, lesson that Jesus is teaching in regard to how we treat one another. Revenge is, is unacceptable behavior. But see, again, in our society, in our culture, in our day and time, some may say even good people may say, well, you know, maybe a little bit of that won't hurt. Maybe just a little bit of that. So as followers of Jesus, we're to rise above retaliation, right? We're to rise above anger. And what we're to do in place of that is to pray for these individuals or individual, not trying to make it worse than it already is. So the heading in my Bible says suffering for righteousness sake. I don't know what yours says, but there's a lot about suffering in the letter that Peter writes. But Peter never guarantees the absence of suffering. Even even if you're doing what is right, he doesn't guarantee that you won't suffer. Even if you're following Jesus, he doesn't guarantee that there won't be suffering. Suffering, our example again is Jesus. So think about him. He always did what was right, correct? He always did. He, he lived and he's the only one to live a perfect life, a sin-free life. And there's a reason for that. It's so that he could be our sacrifice. So that he could be the one. And he still suffered. You think about that. A perfect human being. In every sense. Never wronged anyone. Never sinned. Now you would think that person. And maybe you've thought this about yourself. If I could just be a better person, everyone would like me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Jesus had people lined up, I'm sure, waiting to take a shot at him, right? How many times did they try to kill him? And what were their thoughts about him? Well, so he lives this perfect life and he still suffered. And he died like a criminal. He wasn't a criminal, but he died like one, right? On a cross. Galatians 3, 13, Paul says, who was at one time Saul, the Pharisee, totally against Jesus at one point in his life. Now he's totally for Jesus and God has him writing scripture. Isn't that amazing? Tell me that a life can't turn around. Tell me that God can't do something with you. You're trying to serve Jesus, right? Wow. What can he do with you? What can he do with you? Here's this fellow that doesn't even like Jesus, hates him and his followers. And God turns his life around. Well, Galatians 3, 13, Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And we've read this before, right? So that takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Give me the next slide there, Ben, if you don't mind. I thought this was a pretty good illustration of what we're dealing with. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 to 23. If a man has committed a crime punishable by death and, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. So that's 
where that reference comes from. But Paul says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul says, For our sake he made him to be. Now, God the Father made God the Son to be sin. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus did not sin. But he made this one, this Jesus, the son of God, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So life is tough. Jesus would echo that, right? Life can be tough. It was tough then as Peter was writing this to our brothers and sisters that were scattered and and they needed focus. It, it was tough then and it's tough now, I would say. So most of the time, no one would think of, of harming you if you're doing good. Now, you could find people that are interested in harming, right? I had a, a message that came through. I don't know, it was sometime early in the morning hours about three inmates that had escaped McDonald County Jail. Did you hear about that? So you slept well, not knowing this information. And I thought, well, it's probably just a... No, it was attempted murder and they were all in for and... um, some other things, you know. That got my attention, at least. I thought, well, that's probably just not true and all this. And so first thing this morning when I woke up, I thought, yeah, I got that information. Somebody sent that to none of you. Sent that to me. Someone sent that to me. And I thought, nah, disregard. And then I thought, well, so I did a little search. It's true. I don't know if they found them yet, but are there people interested in harming? Yes, but most of the time, no one's interested in harming you if you're an upstanding citizen, right? You stop at all the stop signs and you you obey all the laws. You're not harassing people. You're just you're just a decent, good person and you're following the law. You know, Peter talks about how we should respond to these kinds of things. But. No promises are made by Peter. There are no promises here. Only the guarantee that that Jesus walks with us and he walks through any, any trouble or any suffering that we might face. That's a guarantee that he will be with us, that he doesn't leave us in times of trouble. Well, that's comforting. There's no guarantee that we won't have suffering, obviously. Mean, cruel, ungodly people can harm you. True? Yes. But God promises a hope, peace, comfort, that outlasts and overshadows anything that Satan can use against us or anything that he could throw against us. So let's take a look at um, Romans chapter 8. You know this. You love this scripture. It's so filled with hope. Romans chapter 8. Maybe you can quote it. Verse 31. What shall we Say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, 
who in who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You see what God is doing for us through Jesus. This is why we hang on to Jesus. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. We'll be able to separate. What about the things out there that the Hubble telescope? We talked about this in class a little bit this morning. What about the things that are beyond our, our reach? The things that we can't see. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate you. If you say yes to Jesus, there is no way that he's going to say, I don't want you. The only way you walk away from that is if you choose to do it. And I think if you taste that the Lord is good, you'll never walk away. That's why I still love sassafras tea. I had it when I was eight years old at the Dogwood Festival. Ladies dressed up in period costumes, a big copper kettle, and they were making sassafras tea. I took one sip and I thought, no, I, I've been chasing that ever since. I, I've never, uh, never tasted it again quite like that. But I'm telling you what, once you, once you taste the Lord, you actually experience Him. You live, you walk with Him and He's walking with you. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. In verse 14, Peter uses another Old Testament reference. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. And Peter is helping us see that evil people cannot harm our eternal souls. They may harm physically, but they can't harm our souls or take us out of the Lord's hand. There's no way that that can happen. No one can do that. So let the Lord rule your thoughts. Let him rule your emotions and only fear God. Only fear God. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So that the antidote for fear is, is this. Setting Apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, giving him that that spot in your heart. In verses 18 through 22 in uh, first Peter three, your baptism, he mentions baptism, your baptism isn't for physical cleansing. You understand that, you know that, but it's but it's for your spiritual cleansing. This cleansing from sin by the blood of Jesus. So have no fear. It's what Peter's getting at. So get a hold of yourself and realize whose whose impact is bigger, God's or Satan's? Who has bigger impact? Now fundamentally they and and probably um, you most likely have figured this out. You, you know. Well, one has the power of life and death. That would be God and one doesn't, and that would be Satan, right? Appeal to the one who can create life. Appeal to that one. It just I was thinking about this. Just because God has the power to send someone to hell, though hell was created for the devil and his angels, right? I intend that it was created for people, but people will follow Satan. They will. They will follow evil. 
But just because God has the power to send someone to hell doesn't mean that he's desiring to do so, right? Just because he has that kind of power. He is all powerful. We don't have that kind of power, but he does. So the reality is that God is the only one with that kind of power and he judges rightly. I mean, he gets it right. So with that power, what he's chosen to do is to send Jesus to be a stand in for you and for me. That's what he has done with his power. By by his wounds, by the wounds of Jesus, we are healed. So make your peace with with God, the father through God, the son, because we were built. We were built to thrive. And this is something that God is interested in through Jesus Christ. And Peter wants us to focus on Christ. So we weren't built to hide in fear, were we? So have no fear. And Peter is saying, live this way in a dark world. Shine this way. Be this way. Have no fear of what people can do to you because you're protected. You're going somewhere. And no one can take the love of God from you. No one can steal your salvation. But God is willing to give it through Jesus Christ. Do you need him today? I would recommend that uh, you not wait, that if you are interested in Jesus and you understand who he is and you understand that you have sin, that what you will do when we're singing this song as a shepherd is here to greet you, you'll step out and let him know, I, I want Jesus. I need him to forgive my sin. And so... We believe what scripture says. We confess Jesus as Lord. We repent of our sins and we're buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. As scripture talks about the washing away of our sins by the blood of Jesus. And then we are in Christ and no one can steal that from you. Have no fear, church. Won't you come as we stand and sing?